right. Like always, we start from some administrative problems. First thing, I forgot to publish the module of this entire chapter two. That's totally my bad. I have all the notes ready for you. I published it after, I mean, around noon after this class, right after it. So that's my bad. Um, thank you for people's reminding. The second one is for the Canvas assignment. So just a kind reminder, your Canvas assignment is due April 12th, um, 12th which means you have two more days to work on it. And I will post a walkthrough of the problem, like how I think about it, what's a stepwise uh, way behind those problems. It will come available after the due date. And then for question number three on the Canvas assignment, um, it's my bad, it has some ambiguity in that problem. You should only use the periodic trend to answer that question. You just look at the periodic table and try to understand which bond is more polar. I know there is an exception that aluminum is more, um, it's less electronegative comparing to beryllium, but we're not talking about those um, exceptions in that question. So use the periodic trend itself. But for this problem, because I didn't make it super clear, the fault is on me, I'll make uh, both answers correct. So for that problem only, depending on how you look at it. But in the future exams and questions, I'll make it more specified using the periodic trend only, um, rank these molecules or so on. All right, any questions before we start? All right, welcome back. And I'm really glad to see not too many people have dropped from organic chemistry, but <laughs> it's okay. All right, let's get started for our week two of organic chemistry. Hopefully it will be fun. So in our week one, we spend some time talking about structures, means we're looking at specific molecules, specific atoms. What are the nature of the chemical bond? What are the nature of these molecules? And how do we represent them on those formula? So from today, we'll be talking about some very basic understanding of chemical reactions. So on today, we'll be talking about equilibrium and thermodynamics. Um, including like kinetics and rate of the reaction. And then on our Wednesday lecture, we'll be talking about reaction mechanisms. Now, why do we care about it? How to use the arrow pushing notation to draw reaction mechanism in organic chemistry. On Friday lecture, we'll be talking about basic acid-base chemistry and how, they, uh, how they're applied in organic chemistry. All right, so these Everything we are talking about in chapter two should build up your vocabulary and also your basic grammar of organic chemistry from now on. All right, getting started for today's class. This should serve as some review for you um, if you took 14B or Chem, um, Chem 20B that's equivalent to each other. So when we're talking about thermodynamics and kinetics, what exactly we're talking about here? So here I have A on the left-hand side of my equation and B on the right-hand side, or conventionally, we call whatever on the left-hand side to be our reactant, and whatever on our right-hand side to be our product. But in reality, Mother Nature doesn't know which is your reactant, which is your product. We just say thermodynamics tells you the relative stability of your reactant product, or in this case, the relative stability of A and B in a specific reaction mixture. Or on this diagram, what we have is thermodynamics just tells you the relative energy between your starting point A and your end point B. So that's a thermodynamic. It sounds scary, it's a new terminology, but it, what, what it actually means is what is the relative stability of your left-hand side and right-hand side of your reaction? How do we know which one has higher concentration? That's all. The kinetic is a different dimension to describe that reaction. 
Just because a reaction is downhill, it's forming the more stable product, doesn't mean that reaction can take place at a reasonable rate. Some reaction might take place, but it will take, say, millions of years, and nobody, nobody can actually observe that taking place. So that's the rate of the reaction we're talking about. And the rate of the reaction, it relates to the relative energy between your reactant, or in this case, A, to what we call a transition point. So that's the energy barrier that needs to over, that A needs to overcome in order to be um, transferred into product B. So we'll spend about half of the class talking about thermodynamics and the other half talking about kinetics. Getting started about thermodynamics. So when we're saying thermodynamics, what we actually say is what is the chemical equilibrium between the two ends of your reaction? So here, for equilibrium, we use equilibrium constant to describe the relative ratio of your uh, left hand and right hand side of your reaction. So here is the full definition of your equilibrium constant, which is pretty long. It basically says, well, we're writing out the equilibrium constant. We write out the products of your right-hand side or your product side on the top, and then you write the concentration product of your reactant or whatever on the left-hand side on the bottom of the equation. So if we look at some example here, what we have is this a mono reaction from just A to form B. The big K, the equilibrium constant here, is just the concentration of B over the concentration of A. Alternatively, you can have multi-component reaction. So if A, B together form C and D, what we have is equilibrium constant K equals to the product of concentration of C times the concentration of D divided by concentration of A and B. Likewise, you can have also A just dissociate into both B and C. So now you have the equilibrium constant of BC on the top and A on the bottom. Take home message in writing out equilibrium constant is you always have product on the top and then reactants on the bottom. All right, so it's always products or the right-hand side of the reaction over reactant or the left-hand side of the reaction. I'll be start talking about the chemical insights of some like mathematical relationship. So whenever I say chemical insight, just means without doing any calculation, just looking at these mathematical equation, what kind of information we can get um, just looking at these. So for example, let's just use the equilibrium constant as an example. <coughs> what does larger equilibrium constant mean? What it's actually meaning in the reaction mixture? If you think about it, the larger equilibrium constants means you have larger concentration of the right component or whatever on your product side, you have higher concentration of your product components. Or the other way to put it is if you have larger K, larger equilibrium constant, we can say your reaction is more goes to completion. Or occasionally we also say it, we have larger thermodynamic driving force. So let me actually just keep our original figure here on the document camera so we can annotate it on our way. So when we say a larger um, thermodynamic driving force, we're having larger K equilibrium. 
so that's the qualitative picture of the equilibrium constant. And moving on to talk about the more quantitative picture, or in the other world, we can look at it. How do we decide the equilibrium constant on, of a certain reaction? Two ways to do it. The first thing, you can actually measure it in the reaction mixture by knowing the concentration of your reactant or your pro and your product. The other way is to connect that equilibrium constant with Gibbs free energy and actually calculate your um, equilibrium constant by knowing the Gibbs free energy. So the equation we use to connect these two properties, the Gibbs free energy and our equilibrium constant is that delta G naught equals to negative RT ln K. So in here, Delta G naught, that's our Gibbs free energy. That's a thermodynamic um, property. We'll talk about how to calculate delta G naught in a couple of minutes. And then you have our gas constant. So that's a constant. So depending on what unit you're using, you have different version or different flavor of gas constant. When doing this calculation, you want to make sure you're using the correct unit there. Um, we also have temperature. So the temperature is always represented in Kelvin. Well, that's because in your gas constant, that's in Kelvin. So when doing the calculation for the temperature, always transfer that into absolute um, Kelvin temperature. And what we're getting here is the big K or the uh, equilibrium constant. So I'll do a quick example here and see how do we derive, how do we use this equation? The question here is say, given the ratio of your compound A and B is 300 to one. So for ev you, the ratio of A and B is 300 to one. For every molecule of B, you have 300 A in that reaction mixture. And it's given at room temperature, or that's 25 degree Celsius. Can you calculate delta G naught for um, the equilibrium of A and B? And it's asking you to express the answer in kilocal per mole. So we can just do this calculation together. We know that delta G naught equals to negative RT law in K, K equilibrium. And here, the K equilibrium is given by product over reactant. So A to B is 300 to 1. So that's 1 over 300. Next step is to plug in numbers and set up the calculation. So what we have is delta G naught equals to negative RT ln K. Where here is asking you to express the number in kilocal per mole. So that's negative 1.986 Kel per Kelvin per mole times the temperature, which is 25 plus 273 in Kelvin times ln natural log of 1 over 300. Or you can plug that into your calculator. It should be able to get something about 3376 kel per mole. Or translate that into kilocal per mole is 3.38 kilocal per mole. All right. So this is just a quick demonstration in how do we do it quantitatively by translating the idea of delta G and the equilibrium constant. Plug in numbers, but pay attention to the units you're using. Before we move on, let's look at how to use this relationship in a faster way, how to get chemical insight by just looking at these equations. What we have is we start from the same relationship, delta G naught equals to negative RT ln K, where K is our equilibrium constant. 
We can write out our equilibrium constant to equals to exponential of negative delta G naught over RT. So these two are equivalent. We'll just rewrite the equation in expressing um, the equilibrium constant in delta G. And the chemical insight we can get by looking at these equations, let me just copy this down, are two pieces. Let's look at two different scenarios. First thing, we can have negative delta G naught. So in this case, when delta G naught is negative, what we have is a positive negative delta G naught over our T term. And this positive number on your exponential function will give you a big equilibrium constant K. Or in the other word, remember equilibrium constant is always product over in, um, reactant, so product over reactant. So that means the equilibrium is tilted towards the product. And we say this is a spontaneous reaction. Or if we're looking, going back to that figure, what we have, if we take the delta G of B minus the delta G of A, we see this process is going to be a spontaneous process with the delta G naught of this process to be a negative number. Alternatively, we could also look at another scenario where you have a positive delta G naught. And apparently now you have a negative term on top of your exponential function. And what that gives you with a negative term on top of your, on top of your exponential function now you are expecting to have a small equilibrium constant K or something that's smaller than one. So what that gives you is equilibrium is tilted towards reactant. Or this is a non-spontaneous reaction. All right, so two different ways you can use the same equation. It can be a quantitative fashion where you're actually calculating delta G naught from the equilibrium constant or vice versa, or a more qualitative understanding, or both. So if we go back to the example we did, so in this process, we calculate the delta G to be a positive number. What it means is the reaction is a non-spontaneous reaction. We're expecting more reactant than the product. And we look at our reaction mixture, and yes, indeed, the concentration of your reactant A is much higher than the concentration of your reaction B, uh, reactant, I mean, product B. All right, so this is the first part. Now we have established a relationship between the Gibbs free energy delta G naught with the equilibrium constant big K. Next question becomes, how do we calculate delta G naught? So this is the equation um, we use to relate delta G naught with two other important thermodynamic state functions, namely the reaction enthalpy, delta H naught, and the reaction entropy, delta S naught. So let's first look at these two terms, one by, um, one, by one, and see what they mean. And then we'll take them together and try to get some chemical insight by reading this equation here. First thing, reaction enthalpy, delta H. So delta H is a function or a number that gives you the energy that's 
coming inherently in the bond strength of your molecule. So stronger, um, in general, molecules with stronger chemical bonds are say more stable and will have um, more negative enthalpy numbers. Or in the other words, uh, we have, when we're talking about chemical reactions, you always have, we, we always say like reactant to product and if we take the difference between the product to the reactant, you can have negative uh, or positive delta H. So in the first example, if the product minus reactant, you have a negative delta H or negative enthalpy change, we say that is a exothermic reaction. So what it means is the reaction will release heat in form um, when the reaction takes place to form more stable chemical bonds or more stable molecule. And whenever this process is taking place, we call this to be an exothermic process, means heat is being released in the process of that chemical reaction. Alternatively, you could have products being less stable comparing to your reactant. So that's called an endothermic reaction. It means your product is less stable comparing to your reactant. Or the reaction absorbs heat in order to form that less stable product. So these you will see, um, you will see this type of question in short answer problems. For example, we can have um, an example question like given aluminum is reacting with iron oxide to form iron and aluminum oxide. So here we have the delta H of the reaction to be a negative number and the question could be, is its reaction exothermic or endothermic? And the answer here is exothermic, apparently. It, it may be more complicated than that. It's like calculating the bond association and energy and calculating delta H and compare it at the very end. The take home message is negative del um, delta H, exothermic reaction, positive delta H, endothermic reaction. The entropy on the other hand is slightly, the concept of entropy is more abstract. As when we say the reaction entropy, what we're actually describing is changes in energy dispersal. <coughs> it's a little bit more abstract than nor what people normally think. Um, so here in a chemical reaction, the rule of sum is saying the more number of molecule we're forming, we see that delta S is a more positive number. Or at least in this class, um, only, we'll only compare um, entropy is depending on if you form um, two products from one reactant or one product from two reactants, that entropy change will be more significant. So for example, when we have one molecule forming two different molecules or multiple molecules, we say this process has a positive entropy value, positive delta S. Alternatively, when you have multiple molecules get together and just form one molecule as your product, this, these processes typically have negative delta S. One quick thing I want to emphasize is people use EU when they talk about the um, entropy. So EU means Kelvin, I mean cal calorie per Kelvin per mole. So when you're calculating delta G, which is normally expressed in kilocal per mole, delta S is normally not expressed in kilocal per mole. So that unit conversion is also important when uh, reading the tables for entropy. Nevertheless, delta H and delta S, these are uh, numbers you can get by either reading a table or something I can give it to you. So what I expect you to know is knowing delta H and delta S of a given chemical reaction, how can you predict whether this reaction is gonna be um, towards the product or per towards the reactant without doing too much calculation? So that's the chemical insight we want to get by reading the equation here. 
So we did this before. We established the relationship between the Gibbs free energy with the equilibrium constant, big K. Remember, when we have a positive delta G, what we're having is the equilibrium is towards the product. And in the other case, when you have negative delta G, or the product's more stable than your reactant, we say the equilibrium is towards your um, product. Sorry, positive means it's towards reactant. Negative means it's towards products. And now we know delta G equals to delta H minus T delta S. Some of the quick chemical intuition we can get by just reading it. First of all, in order to get more negative delta G to push the equilibrium towards a product, we want to get more negative delta H, or the reaction is forming more stable product. It's more <coughs> exothermic. More negative delta H can give you more negative delta G. Or alternatively, we have that negative T delta S term. So we can either have more positive delta S so note positive delta S happens when you have one molecule dissociate into multiple products. Or you can also have higher temperature. So all these three will give you more negative delta G naught, or means your equilibrium is shift towards the product. All right. So I'm going to quickly pause here for some questions, because we're switching gear to talk about kinetics in chemical reactions. See if we have questions on thermodynamics before we move on. So I'm just going to write it on the table here. The two equations we use in thermodynamics is delta G naught equals to negative RT ln K, and then delta G naught equals to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. And if you have a negative delta G naught, the take home message is you have the more stable product being formed and this reaction is called to be spontaneous. Yes. Right, so the question is, well, we're talking about thermodynamics of a reaction. What we're actually talking about is the relative stability of your reactant and product. So in here, whenever we say the thermodynamic driving force is towards the product, what we're saying is we're forming the more stable products. And um, in that process, we have different equations to calculate the equilibrium constant associated. Uh, so the question is, will the spontaneous reaction be stable? I would say these are two different concepts. Okay. A spontaneous reaction, just say this process, the delta G of B minus delta G of G of B and minus the Gibbs free energy of A is a negative number. So spontaneous just tells you the delta G of the reaction is a negative number. And what that means is we're forming the more stable product. So there are two different concepts here. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay, I saw there's a question follow, but that's okay. Any other questions? Okay, I hope I'm like satisfying everybody, not like confuses everybody, but it's okay. I'll take more questions outside if you, if you feel like it. But now let's move on to talk about kinetics of the reaction. So here, uh, we were using spontaneous and non-spontaneous when we talk about thermodynamics. And it, just because a reaction is spontaneous doesn't mean it can take place at your normal condition. So kinetics just directly relates to the reaction rate. So here, 
for a reaction that is spontaneous, it is possible to have too much a kinetic barrier, then it does not take place at your normal condition. So here, kinetics is related to the rate of the reaction, and the thermodynamics is related to the relative stability of your reactant and product. So we're switching gear to talk about the rate of the reactant. So when we're talking about rate of the reaction, we need to talk about, well, three different factors actually contributing to the rate of the reaction. The first and the most obvious one is the effect of the concentration on the reaction rate. So these are the very oversimplified rate laws we will, will be talking about or will be mentioning in this class. For example, if we start from A to form B, we only have one reactant. So here we can say this reaction is a first order reaction, or in the other word, it's the rate of the reaction equals to a rate constant times the concentration of your reactant A. It's a first order because it only considered the concentration of one reactant. Alternatively, you could have second order reaction where we have the rate depends on the concentration of both reactants. <coughs> so in both cases, we see that concentration is playing a role in the overall rate of your reaction. So what does that mean? What does this equation actually tell us? So let's look at one example and get some chemical insights from that calculation. So the example I want to do together is say now we have a hypothetical reaction. Well, not hypothetical. It's actually taking place. It's a nucleophilic substitution reaction of methane chloride reacting with sodium hydroxide to form methanol and sodium chloride. So this is a second order reaction. And what we're giving are the starting concentration or the initial concentration of both your reactants. So assume some young chemist measured the initial reaction rate to be 10 to the negative 4 more per liter per second. Can you calculate the reaction rate after 75% of the methane chloride is being consumed? So I'll leave the problem here and we can work on it together. All right, the first thing, set up the calculation. We have our rate law, so that's second order. What that means is rate equals to K times concentration of methane chloride times concentration of sodium hydroxide. And then what we can have as first of all, we know the initial condition. We know what is the initial reaction rate. So let's set up the calculation here. So rate initial equals to K times the initial concentration of methane chloride, which is 0.2 molar times initial concentration of sodium hydroxide, which is 1.0 molar. And that gives you 10 to the negative 4 more per liter per second. So looking at it, we can write out this small k to be equal to 10 to the negative 4 divided by 0.2 molar, 1.0 molar. And then what the question is asking is what is the rate after 75% of methane chloride is being consumed or at 25%? So that equals to K times the amount of methane chloride that's left, which is 0.2 times 0.25, so that's a leftover times the amount of sodium hydroxide that's left, so 1.0 minus 0.2 times 0.75. So that's 75% of the methane chloride being used up. And here we can plug in our small k in this calculation. <coughs> 
So that's how we set up the calculation. So let's see. You can plug in the numbers here. We have k equals to 10 to the negative 4 divided by 0.2 times 1. So that's a small k divided by, well, times, sorry. 0 0.5 times 0.25, then times 1 minus 0.2 times 0 0.75. And that gives us the answer to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, about 2.1 times 10 to the negative 5. at 25%. All right. So when looking at these numbers, we can get some chemical intuition from this sample question. So one thing you can get is if we look at the initial rate of the reaction, we know that the rate initial equals to 10 to the negative 4 more per liter per second. So the chemical insight we can get by looking at the effect of concentration on the reaction rate is that when the concentration of the reactant decreases, our rate will also decrease. So that's why in organic chemistry, your rate is not a constant process in your reaction mixture. I mean, depending on how complete your reaction is, your reactant concentration is getting smaller and smaller, and your rate is becoming uh, slower and slower. So that's a piece of chemical insight you can get out of it. All right. OK, so coming back to this table here. The first piece of information is we have our rate equals to some rate constant times the concentration of your reactant. Depending on if it's first order or second order, you can have multiple terms in that concentration. And the insight we're getting is the lower reactant concentration will lead to lower rates. Is it going above? All right, so that's the first piece of information we had on that figure. And moving on to talk about other effects on your reaction rate. For example, we can have temperature affecting your reaction rate as well. In order to quantify the affection, um, effect of temperature on the reaction rate, now we're talking about how to estimate or how to quantitatively calculate your rate constant, small k here. The small k, we can use the Arrhenius equation to estimate it. So here in the Arrhenius equation, what we have is A. So that is a reaction-specific factor. You can imagine that to be a number that's given to you or a constant. What's important is in the exponential term here, you have the activation energy, or Ea here. So that is actually what's representing here in this green arrow. That's the activation energy barrier for the reaction to take place. And then in here, we also have gas constant and temperature in your Arrhenius equation. Like what we always did, you can always do calculations on using the Arrhenius equation, but I like to use the more qualitative figure to give you an idea about the chemical insight. Like now, without doing any calculation, Say, how does the temperature affect your reaction rate? How does the activation barrier affect your reaction rate? So let's get that logic out straight for you. So let's do that together. We'll put this equation here just for your reference. The first piece of chemical insight I hope you can get is how does the activation energy barrier, or EA, affect your reaction rate? So with larger EA, activation energy barrier, what we are having is more negative 
EA over RT term. And a more negative EA over RT term in your exponential function means you have a smaller, small k. So this is the term we're talking about here. Right, the more negative that term is in your exponential, the smaller your rate constant small k will become. And consequently, a slower reaction you would expect. So larger activation energy barrier, slower reaction. Second piece of chemical insight is focusing on the temperature here. So when temperature increases or we have higher temperature, assuming our activation energy barrier is the same, we'll have less negative Ea over Rt term. And a less negative Ea over Rt term will give you larger rate constant small k and faster reaction. So let me add that Arena's equation to what we have here. So that's k equals to constant times exponential negative Ea over RT. What we have is larger EA, slower rate, and larger temperature is faster reaction. And you can get this information by just looking at the Arena's equation. So again, here is my idea of all these equations. As you'll feel like yourself really sad if you want to remember all these trends. But the bottom line here is you just look at the Arena's equation and using that one equation and you do some logic thinking over the relationship there, you can derive all these relationships. There's no need of hard memorization. All right, I'll pause here to see if we have any questions and then we'll do one example question together. Any questions? Okay, I guess I'm doing a very good job today or a very awful job today. <laughs> Let's do an example together and maybe we'll have more questions after the class. <laughs> or read this question. <laughs> it's in your notes, so you don't need to take a picture. I'll leave it there. So let's imagine a reaction which is a pyrolysis of chloroethane to form ethane and also hydrochloric acid. So the reaction is given here. You have the um, chloroethane react, um, re dissociate to form ethane, sorry, that's sorry, and hydrochloric acid. So it is given the delta H of the reaction to be a positive number, 15.5 kcal per mole, and the delta S of the reaction, also a positive number, because we're dissociating, we're forming two products from one reactant, so to be 31.3 EU. It's asking for two things. First, to calculate the delta G naught of the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius. Also ask you to express your answer in kcal per mole, and answer the question, is the reaction spontaneous? And then giving some constant, and we're talking about the reverse reaction here. And it's giving some constant and asking you to calculate the rate constant at 500 degrees Celsius. So we can just work on it together. Again, the harder part of this class is not to remember all those equations, it's know where to find it. So for example, in this case, it's calculating delta G, and you read the question, it's given delta H and delta S. So you should be able to instantaneously get the reaction we want to use has delta G and delta H and also delta S in it. So it might sound easy here because that's what we talk about in class. 
But once we build up so many different equations, you need to get familiar to recall what equation to use in order to catch that fast in the exam. So let's work on it. So delta H equals to 15.5 kilocal per mole. So that's reading what's given in your problem. So that's here. Minus T delta S. So T, we want to transfer that 25 into Kelvin. And then times delta S. 31.3, so EU is Kelvin per, as calorie per Kelvin per mole, and we want to transfer that into kilocal. And one of the things I like to do is to cancel out all my units and make sure they are consistent on when we're doing plus and minus together. So here, after we cancel out the unit, so again, this is what we're doing, is temperature in Kelvin, and we make sure they're in the same unit. I'll just jump to the answer here, just plug in your calculator. What we're getting is 6.2 kilocal per mole at room temperature. So what it means is this reaction is a non-spontaneous reaction. So what that means is your reactant is favored over your product. So that's the first part. It is plug-in numbers, yes, but take some time, um, pay some extra attention to the unit when actually plug-in numbers, and read it carefully because it might have two parts asking um, about it. Second part of the reaction, we're talking about the reverse reaction. So the actual reaction of interest is the ethane reacting with hydrochloric acid. It's an addition reaction to form our chloroethane. So for this process, it's asking for the small k at 500 degrees. So we want to use the Arena's equation. So small k equals to a times exponential negative EA divided by RT. So we read the problem and we see that A equals to 10 to the 14. Plug in the numbers in the exponential term. Activation energy, that's 58.4 kilocal per mole divided by the gas constant. Well, it's already given there. That's 1.986 Kel per Kelvin, calorie per Kelvin per mole times our temperature. That's 500 degrees. So that's 773 Kelvin. And that's divided by 1,000 to get kilocal per mole. And we cancel out our unit here to make ours. And here, the more and more cancel, kilocal, kilocal cancel. So on that exponential term, that term shouldn't have any unit in there. You plug the number, and you get a pretty small rate constant. You could well expect a follow-up question on this, as now given the concentration, can you calculate the actual rate of the reaction? I didn't go that far in this example, but that's a natural follow-up question. So I'll take any questions outside. I'm a little worried because I didn't get enough questions in class, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs>